Hi, I'm Jack Cush with Room Now. I have on the line Dr. Kevin Winthrop from Oregon Health and Science University in Oregon, Portland, Oregon. Kevin, how are you today? Good. Thanks, Jack, for having me. How are you doing down in Texas? Doing great. We're surviving the, the COVID siege. Uh, for those of you who don't know Kevin, and you should know Kevin, I refer to him as the master of disaster. He knows what to do when things get rough. Oh. You and Apollo Creed, right? Um, yeah, I would. So, so Kevin is an infectious disease consultant who's worked with the CDC and has uh, worked with a lot of rheumatology projects over the years and really well-versed in many of our issues and our drugs. Um, asked him to come on to talk about some COVID issues. So Kevin, first, what do you, first, this is a two-part question, what are you telling your patients and what's your version of social distancing? Yeah, well, um, those are great questions. You know, I, everything's in evolution, Jack. I think uh, everyone's, the answers to those questions seem to be changing every couple of days as the perception of risk uh, changes. Um, I'd say my patients have grown much more anxious the last uh, two to three weeks, uh, as I'm sure yours have as well. And um, what I'm telling my patients is, you know, hey, this is time to hit the pause button. Uh, it's time to focus on you and your health and try to figure out how to be the healthiest you can be with regards to nutrition and exercise. And really, you know, I, I'm encouraging my patients to go outside uh, one hour a day and exercise. Now, I'm also encouraging them to do that alone and to maintain social distancing, which I guess plays into your, your second question. But particularly as the weather gets nicer, and, and particularly older people, people who really on, honestly, it's not beneficial for them to be sitting around the house all day doing nothing. Um, they need to really try to be exercising to the best ability that they can, you know, physically. Um, and so, you know, some of that can be done inside, obviously, but I think it is healthy to get outside. Obviously, where I live in Portland, it's a little different than, say, New York City. I mean, we can all pretty much go outside and, you know, we're not going to have a crowd of people all around us. And that might be different in places like Madrid or New York or other places. But, but I think by and large, I'm, I'm really trying to focus patients on uh, or focus my message to patients on really focusing on themselves and their health and, and really a message of primary prevention. I, they, you don't want to get this stuff, particularly if you're older and have a variety of comorbidities that you're aware of. So a lot of rheumatology patients are in this, this category of high risk. Um, you know, and then there's the immunosuppressants, which we can talk about later. But a lot of these folks, you just, you just want to avoid this stuff. So the way to do that is to focus on your own health and make your immune system as strong as it can be by, by yourself with nutrition and exercise. And the other thing is just to stay away from people um, as much as you can. So, you know, most of us are, at these, are in these stay-at-home type, shelter-in-place type orders. I don't know if you guys are. We are. A number of states are. And I think pretty much everyone uh, will be if they're not already. Um, but that doesn't preclude going outside and exercising uh, with a social distance. So right now, social distance is six feet. Um, that may be, you know, one or two more feet than you need to be. I mean, I think the, the risk of catching COVID uh, on a hiking trail or on a beach is unbelievably small if you're at least three or four feet away from someone. I mean, the, the chance that someone coughs or sneezes and that droplet hits you in the right spot from that distance uh, under, you know, with wind and sun and all those things going on is, is pretty low. So, I mean, right now, public health authorities have kind of settled on the six foot distance. I think that's a great distance. It's very, um, you know, I, I think it's probably very conservative in terms of the estimate. Um, so, uh, but I, you know, I think five or six feet away seems really reasonable. Obviously, if you're with your spouse, it's different, or if you're with your kid, it's different. Um, you know, you're, you're quarantined with that person, you can probably hang out with them. Um, but, you know, I have a lot of patients who are older, they're not seeing their grandkids right now, they're not seeing their kids right now. And um, I think that's warranted. I, I think I would lay low if I was at high risk for, for the next four to six weeks until hopefully some of the dust settles. So I want to underscore a few main points there. One, hit the pause button. Two, um, exercise, three, lay low, four, we should be having this conversation on the beach, meaning me and Grenada, you and Maui, and uh, we could do this very effectively. Uh, oh, it'd, be, be risk. it'd be so much nicer six feet away from you, Jack. Right now, I feel too distant. <laughs> well, you know, we hear a lot of talk about the drugs that we use, you know, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, the IL-6 inhibitors, but you talked last week at Room Now Live about baricitinib and the research on baricitinib showing that it is a, 
an inhibitor of AAK1, which is important in viral endocytosis, which is how the virus gets into the cell. And they're working on drugs that basically inhibit viral endocytosis. My question is, how good is that data for baricitinib look? And does this, does this also extend to the other JAK inhibitors? And what else should we be looking for in new therapies or things that are good for our patients? Yeah, that's a great question. I guess my answer is tripart. One is, you know, the, the question is always coming up, what, what the patient is on and whether they should stop it. And my answer, I think, has been consistent with your answers and others, experts, that, you know, we, we think disease control is really important. And we think interruption of disease control potentially leads you to, you know, other therapies we're less excited about, like steroids, um, in terms of risk. So, so I think stopping or starting DMARDs because of the fear of Comard right now, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Number two, um, you know, are some riskier than others? And, you know, obviously the, the JAKs as a class have this um, issue with increased viral infections. Most of that has to do with, I mean, really all of it, at least what we've appreciated so far, has to do with reactivation of latent viral infections, which really has to do with cell-mediated immunity and some other factors. But, but really, we don't know a whole lot about the risk of uh, new viral infections. Uh, and is it elevated? Um, we think it probably would be, knowing how the JAKs work. Um, and I think it probably should be, but, but we don't know really. And we don't know that if, if, even if you have an elevated risk of getting it, what is your risk of, of getting bad, you know, having a bad outcome? They're really two separate concepts. You know, you have this increased risk potentially of getting something, and then you have the risk of once you've got it, are you going to have a bad outcome? Are you going to get really sick or not or die? And they're, they're kind of two separate concepts. And, um, you can see like some of how these drugs are being looked at, you know, the IL-6 inhibitors are being looked at in people who are already in the second concept, they're already really sick. We're trying to see if we can limit the badness associated with uh, being really sick, limit, limit ARDS and sepsis and death. Um, and, you know, the risk or the benefit of that type of drug might be very different on the front end than it is on the back end. And so you can make these hy hypothetical ideas or statements, you know, with regards to a lot of the drugs. Baricitinib is one of those. So, um, I don't know that there's any data. I know that, you know, there's some theoretical understanding about how Barry works uh, that I, to my knowledge, is different than the other JAKs in terms of inhibiting the, the kind, as you mentioned, which is important to viral endocytosis. So I think theoretically, you know, Barry could be, you know, protective in terms of initial infection, whereas the other JAKs might not. But again, that's completely theoretical. I don't know of any data looking uh, at that. I mean, there's other... We need more research. We need to hear more before we make a yeah. judgment on that. I was just going to say Losartan. I mean, there's a lot of drugs uh, on Losartan, this. Losartan, what? List. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Thank, God right, I, <laughs> thank God I have hypertension. I'm on Losartan. Um, you know, I, I mean, there's an RCT for Losartan, too, for the same reasons. that It, it seems to, uh, theoretically, it might uh, diminish endocytosis of the virus and protect pneumocytes or alveolar cells. So these are, again, these are just ideas uh, that, that deserve to be tested, but there's a number of other compounds on this list too. There was a nice publication two or three weeks ago in Lancet that kind of went through this mechanism of what, what drugs might diminish viral entry into cells and therefore be protective up front. And so baricitinib was on that list. All right, we'll, uh, we'll find that citation and tweet it out to people. Um, you know, a number of us are getting questions about getting tested purely on the basis of sort of like seven degrees of Kevin Bacon contact, meaning, you know, I was in the grocery store and then I, ha I found out one of the, check the, the clerks there came down with COVID. Do I need to be tested? How do you handle the, uh, that kind of issue and the need for testing? Yeah. Since seeing the paper today here, I mean, people have been critical of our health department because they haven't been releasing that type of information about people who've been tested. And I, you know, I'm in complete support of the health department. What, what are you going to do with that information uh, if you're a person that shopped at whatever grocery store and last week someone tested positive? Well, first of all, here you can't even, until recently, you couldn't even get a test. So, I mean, just knowing that wasn't going to help you because you couldn't get tested unless you were really, really sick and a high, a high suspect for COVID. Um, now that's changing now that we're, we're starting to have more uh, testing capabilities. I don't know what yours are like there. Ours are still very limited. Um, we can order, I can order a test on a patient in the clinic, but I won't know the result for three to five days. Um, 
So this is changing rapidly. Next week, it's going to be different. We're going to have a lot more capacity as a lot of these universities come online. I mean, we're going to start doing our own tests. One of the hospital systems here started doing their own tests. So we're going to have a lot more capacity uh, locally. Um, and I'm sure that'll be the case across the country. But, um, you know, I, I would not um, use that kind of information to, to go seek out a test. Certainly, if you're symptomatic, you should be going to seek out a test. I, right. I don't really see the rationale at this point for testing mass numbers of asymptomatic people, even if you could. Um, you know, someone has to keep track of the test results. Someone has to report them to the health department. The health department has to take some action and have a plan to deal with positive tests. And so certainly focusing on people who are um, uh, sick or symptomatic makes sense, uh, both as a clinician as well as a public health entity. And then, you know, in terms of testing asymptomatic people, that might be something that has great value in certain settings where you're trying to, you know, um, maybe release a quarantine around a certain setting or allow a certain group of people to do a job or do something like a healthcare work, testing healthcare workers, for example, make sure they're clear before they go, go work. I mean, you can come up with a lot of different settings and scenarios where that type of targeted testing might be um, useful, but we're not there yet. We're, we're still weeks away even from that capacity to have that conversation. So we should probably talk more in a couple of weeks. Yeah. You, you might have just noticed I put my hand up to my mouth and I realized, oop, um, I'm going to have to edit that out. Um, you know, this past weekend, uh, Chuck Todd on Meet the Press asked two political people, what is this, what does success look like in this story? And they both flubbed the question. They had no idea what the next best thing was to look forward to. My answer was pretty, qu pretty quick and easy. The first success we need is a change in behavior. Once we have changes in behavior, we've got a chance of doing what we're trying to do, which is blunt the curve and all that. Do you have a version of what's the next thing we should look forward to and say we're doing we're doing well? What's that benchmark for you? Yeah, I got asked by a reporter yesterday, what when are we going to get back to normal? I said, which normal, like the new normal or, or the old normal? Um, I, I think we're going to have a new normal after this, Jack. And I, I know you've you probably think the same. I mean, our healthcare, the way we deliver healthcare is going to be different. We're going to be doing a lot more of this virtual stuff. Um, and there'll be way different ways that people interact with each other. Um, and maybe some of our behaviors are going to permanently change because of this. Um, I, I think we'll get back to, you know, somewhat normal, but I think it's going to be a while. I, I think honestly, we're we're going to be in this type of social distancing situation where, you know, most things are closed and people are supposed to maintain their distance, you know, for at least several months, maybe three or four months. And then after that, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, you know, I think what you'll see is that we'll have to make a series of risk-based decisions, you know, as we go along, it's always a benefit risk analysis around, you know, should people be able to do this? Or should we open this? Should we open schools? Should we close schools? You know, you can go down the list. There's all these decisions that health officials and politicians have had to make. And, and it's, it's a constant risk benefit. And it will change. And then, you know, the things that are going to allow us to get back to more normal are, you know, increased testing, so we can actually know who's infected and who's not. Um, therapies, if we develop an effective therapy in the next four to six months, which I'm, you know, I'm quite optimistic about, honestly, uh, and then eventually a vaccine. So all those things are really going to allow, um, allow us to change the risk benefit profile in different settings and different populations and allow us to, to you know, change the way we're um, living probably more close back to normal, you know, as we, as we go here. So to, to me, success is, um, you know, limiting the potential damage to the healthcare systems, which which I think is was a huge risk, and I think we're starting to see that in some places in the U.S. now. Um, and the other success is, you know, you know, minimizing the number of deaths, because I think you know if the the infection went widespread, you've seen all the modeling and the numbers, we, we'd have you know thousands and thousands of deaths. So, so I think, you know, those those are those are two metrics of success. And then who to listen to? I think that was part of your question. I mean. I think CDC's messaging from the get-go has been excellent. And I, I obviously I'm biased, I used to work there and I know a lot of people involved in this, but, but I think their messaging has been excellent. I, I think our own health department at the state level's messaging has been excellent. Um, I think our governor, people are critical of her, of her being too slow, but other people aren't, and I'm not. I mean, I think, you know, if you look at the way she's made decisions, it's been very risk-benefit-based risk and very timely. I mean. You know, so 
you know, you can always be a Monday morning quarterback in all these situations, but, but I, I think, you know, in terms of who to listen to, I, I like listening to the, the public health officials. I think they've been giving good messaging around um, risk and make in ways to mitigate your risk personally, as well as a community. Okay. Kevin, we have you on because you're who we listen to and we're thankful for you to take the time today. Um, we'll talk to you soon about this same subject, I'm sure. Take care of yourself. All right, you too, Jack. Don't touch yourself or anyone else. <laughs> See ya.